musical theater mash. Hello, happy Thanksgiving, and more importantly, happy, happy, happy Native American Heritage Day Eve. I hope you're all doing okay, given all of it. Um, I'm here to talk to you about something that's not musical theater. You may not know this about me unless you follow me on Twitter, which you totally should go do, but by day, I am a high school technical theater director, which you can also tell by my wearing of flannel, uh, wearing of a goatee, and unkempt hair. And of course, in the midst of a global pandemic, being a high school technical theater director is a wildly different job. A job for which, strangely, I'm uniquely suited by also having a bizarre set of skills editing video and communicating on the internet. Now, I know a lot a lot of people are trying to figure out how to do digital theater, which is a weird name for it anyway, and we just wrapped on our fall production, so I wanted to walk you through what we did in hopes that it might help you, educator out there, with your digital production. So, here are my thoughts on educational theater during a global pandemic. Catchy title, huh? But the title's still awful. Yes, little Sally. Yes, it is. Like everyone and their mother this pandemic season, we did uh, She Kills Monsters virtual rounds uh, th this fall because it's easy, it's written for online, and it, 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 it's suited well to high school aged actors. In order, here's how we thought about how to do this. Our first thought was, well, if we're gonna do it live, we might as well just do it on Zoom. Our kids do their digital schooling on Zoom anyway. They know how to use it. People know how to log in. We'll set it up. You know, they can mute and unmute their cameras and we'll just do it live live on Zoom. And we toyed around with, you know, can we do some fun stuff with virtual backgrounds or have someone whose video is muted and they can run sound effects during the thing. And I think as a low tech, easy solution, just do it on Zoom is a great solution for uh, a lot of people out there. You know, just rehearse it on Zoom and then you're gonna perform it on Zoom. And one of the things that I think is important that informed all of the choices we made around how we were gonna do this performance is that our priorities kind of shifted. Instead of the show being about the performance, which it often ends up being about in educational theater, this year the show very much had to become about the kid's experience, right? The the kind of social experience you get as a high school kid doing a show. I would say that during the before times, that angle of like the show as a social experience is kind of neglected, not because it doesn't happen, but because it happens so easily. In the 10 minutes before rehearsal starts, kids are talking about whatever the gossip of the day is and they develop their jokes and like that social experience is baked into the experience of performing a show live and rehearsing it as such. Once you end up digitally, everything has to be manufactured. There is no accidental interaction. It's a big pull to even get people to log on to your platform. And so there's no side chat, there's no secondary conversations. And so doing it on Zoom, it's worth it to build in some of those moments. At the beginning of rehearsal, send your kids into a breakout room for 20 minutes to do warm ups or whatever, just do the kids stuff, talk about the stuff without the adults watching them. And at the end of the day, we did end up doing all of our rehearsals through Zoom, but Zoom was not our final performance platform. So here was my progression, and it was a wild ride. First, early experiments proved that Zoom, while adequate, was kind of boring. And I'm a techie guy, I, I know video stuff, and like, there are greener pastures out there. There must be something we can do that's better. So I start looking into what are the other digital streaming services out there. First, of course, I landed on StreamYard. I adore StreamYard. You can do so many things with StreamYard. In digital schooling, I'm in charge of a lot of stuff, and we do our weekly all-school assemblies via StreamYard. It's super easy. You don't need to know a lot of tech to get into it, and if you're an educator trying to, you know, sort out our new digital existence, StreamYard is, is absolutely a platform you should be looking into. But StreamYard has some limitations, the most important being you can only have 10 people in your stream, even backstage at once, and our cast was 12, not including people running the show, so 
StreamYard was out. Also, some of the customization of like trying to perform a show with it is pretty rudimentary. It, it, it's good for like kind of talking heads, podcasting about a thing. It's not so great for like artistic performance of a piece once you get past maybe four or five people. So then I started looking into the grown up tools. OBS, Open Broadcaster Software. If you've ever seen any professional Twitch streamer, this is what they're using. Also, very super useful tool takes a minute to get into, but if you're a tech savvy person, not that hard to figure yourself out. And OBS is a great platform for putting together a stream, but the secondary thing we needed to figure out was how to pull in the remote streams of our student performers. If I were gonna go back in time- And according to my calculations, we've just traveled through time. Try this again. I would probably just use Zoom to ingest the uh, remote performances of the actors. Now that I'm Zoom, you can lock where the squares are on the screen. It'd be as easy as like plugging in a second monitor, full screening your Zoom there, and then through OBS, screen sharing just portions of that Zoom performance. And then in OBS, you could build your cues that fade in and out the squares or move them around or do whatever, you know, hanky-panky, artsy stuff you want to do. But I didn't think of that at the time, so step Step one was to look into something that's called NDI. This is something related to pro broadcasting that I don't quite understand, but what I did understand was that Skype would allow you to ingest separate NDI streams into OBS so that if you had a Skype call with a certain number of people, you could pull each of their cameras in individually as a camera in OBS and then switch between them. And so we looked into that, but it was complicated because you can't get Skype if your school has Microsoft accounts tied to your school email addresses. They want you to use something called Skype for Business, which is going out of they're not going to be supported anymore, but Skype for Business isn't the same as Skype, and instead they want you to use Microsoft Teams instead, which is basically Skype on the inside, I've learned, but different. And then to get that turned on, there were, like, group permissions to, like, enable NDI that would allow everyone to turn on their NDI stream, and it was a nightmare. Not the worst nightmare. We did eventually get it to work, and I could ingest NDI streams from Microsoft Teams into OBS. If you want more details on how it worked out, send me a Twitter DM. It's too complicated for a video. But what we learned is, at least based on my testing, there is an unwritten limit of how many NDI streams you can make Microsoft Teams successfully create to ingest into OBS. And guess what that limit is? Ten. Back to the drawing board. The next thing I stumbled across was a project, a website called obs.ninja. This is a labor of love by a guy named Steve Sagun. I think that's how you say his last name. Um, that is built for stuff like this. You need a little more technical know-how to get into this because it has to do with URL parameters and like check out the wiki. It takes some messing around. But the basic idea is you open a website on your computer that turns on your webcam. Then I, on my separate OBS master computer, open a separate website that gives me that camera feed. And actually I open that website inside OBS. And so then again, I now have a camera feed of your face, your, you know, the kid's laptop at home for their acting. But there's a problem in modern versions of Google Chrome for Mac that make it so on the receiving end of the OBS Ninja, you can't, it doesn't work. And so then you have to either use a Windows computer or install Boot Camp on your Mac to get it to work and then boot into Windows on your Mac so that you can ingest it using the bug-free version of Chrome for Windows that makes it work in OBS. So I did that. So we got that working. There were some different hiccups here and there based on kids' home internet connections, and you can adjust the URL parameters in OBS Ninja to kind of compensate for that. But in the end, we got 14 streams coming into OBS, 12 performers, and then two, me, the tech director, and the actual director to pop in when we needed to. And so we started building the show in OBS. We started programming in queues. You can make people's boxes zoom in and out at appropriate or comedic times. You can do some rudimentary special effects and probably more complicated ones if I dove into a little bit more. You can program sound cues and, you know, background changes and all sorts of stuff, kind of like what you would do in QLab. But then we ran into our most insurmountable obstacle of all. <laughs> Latency. Now, I have found myself explaining digital video conferencing latency to a bunch of people these days, and I don't know if anyone ever really gets it or if they just nod and they're like, okay, Tommy, but let me try again. 
you're on Zoom or FaceTime or Teams, whatever, and you say something into your computer. Then, like Mike TV and Willy Wonka, that digital file gets broken into a thousand bits and sent through the internet and then appears on the other person's computer. And that takes a little bit of time. Just a little bit, but a little bit of time. So from when it came out of your mouth to when it hit the other person's ears can be sometimes a tenth of a second or so. I have learned in the industry, this is called mouth to ear time. It's a thing. For normal conversations, we can deal with a latency of about a tenth of a second to a quarter second. That's tolerable. But this is why sometimes on Zoom and in other places you see the conversations fall apart because you've said something and the other person hears it a little later and they think you're done talking, but then you start talking before they start talking and then it just ends up in this mess. And this happens everywhere, not just on Zoom, it happened in OBS Ninja in our setup. And what it leads to is a breakdown of the art. Anytime someone delivers a line, there's just a bit of lag before the next line comes back. And it makes things like comedic timing or appropriate interruptions of a line entirely impossible to accomplish in a virtual setting. I mean, you would have to be so well rehearsed to be able to preempt the other person's line to get that timing right. And so the director and I had a discussion and we made the decision we're not gonna do it live. And I know, I know you clicked on this video because you wanted to learn how to do digital theater live in your high school and take my advice, don't. Because remember, it's about the kids' experience, about the social experience, about how they're interacting with each other. And all you're doing by deciding that you're gonna perform the show synchronously while you stream it is setting up yourself for more stress, setting up yourself where more things can go wrong. And can you imagine if you're the kid on the night whose internet goes down or their microphone breaks or whatever, there's a thousand things that can go wrong. And unlike a real theatrical production where I could run backstage and fix whatever, we're sunk. We can't even communicate with the kid if something goes wrong. And how devastating would that be? On the other hand, can you create the same social experience while also deciding that you're going to record, edit, and then stream the production. We decided that you can do that. Here's how we did that. As before, we held our rehearsals and performances in Zoom. And every time we would click that record button on Zoom so that we had a record of what happened. Because who knows these days, a kid could get sick, their computer could blow up, all sorts of things could go wrong. And so just, Keeping everything is important so that you can make something in the end. We also asked kids to individually record on their own computers using QuickTime. It's super easy to do. You just open QuickTime next to Zoom and then under file, there's an option that's like new camera recording or something. And then you just hit record and that gives you a recording of the webcam that's exactly the same as Zoom, but is stored locally and is slightly higher quality, which is better to work with in the final edit. We also, and I can't recommend this enough, had everyone wear headphones. It was easy with She Kills Monsters. They're kids on their laptops for the most part, kind of zooming into this digital world, but have them wear headphones because that separates out what they're hearing from the Zoom call versus their individual performance and is going to make your edit in the end much easier. The other thing we did, taken straight from Hollywood, was we did a marker. We did a clapperboard at the beginning of each thing. I would sit on the Zoom. I had a little timer 10 second countdown on my phone and I had every kid say out loud, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 through 0 that the timer went on and on 0 clap. That made it much easier in the end for me to sync up all 12 performers hour-long performance and gave me a head start of setting that up. You do your performance best you can on Zoom. What's nice about it is, and you can tell kids this, is unlike on stage, if you flub on a line, if you go up, try not to do this a lot, but you can say like, hold on, go back a second and retry that performance if you get it wrong. Kids would finish their recording. We had a Google Drive folder where they could upload it. They labeled it very well with their name and the date. And then I ended up with about 12 recordings for each performance night. We did three takes total, one for every performance we would have done for the real life show. And this gave kids a pretty close representation of their performance night. It's the, you know, they were still able to feel some nerves before it. We still kind of did it in real time. It created for a good experience. Then, me and the director got to work. He watched the Zoom recordings of all three nights and decided 
which scene of which performance was the best take. Because there's no reason to do three different performances. You should just choose which one worked out well. And a lot of this didn't have to do with performance. It had to do with like technical issues and like who actually, you know, who had the most viable performance. And there were a couple times, but not many, where we kind of melded performances, where one character would be the Thursday performance and one character would be the Friday performance and we cut them together so they made sense. Then, Final Cut Pro. So there's a demo for Final Cut Pro. If you're a, a theater teacher, you can get, I think, 90 days free and it's worth it to edit your shows in Final Cut Pro because it allows you to move the boxes of your filming around using this transform tool here. And you're gonna kind of like start doing some math, figure out your proportions, figure out your numbers. Like how do you want to space the different performers in this moment so it's comedic? And you can keyframe them, you can make them fly in and fly out. There are tutorials for this on the internet. It's super simple. and once you get the bare bones of this, you can start making some artistic decisions that kind of replicate the real life theatrical performances of entrances and exits. The other thing I ended up doing a lot of is what me and the director ended up calling rebuilding the performance. Because of our aforementioned problem with latency, we had to make up some time for all of those moments where the performance lags. In comes the speed tool. This will get a little tutorial-y here for a second, uh, but in each of these clips, you can actually adjust separate parts and how fast they go. So between when someone says a line and when someone says the next line, I can slightly speed up the video of the person who isn't talking. So by the time their response line comes back in, it is at the time they thought it was. Was. Between when someone says a line and when someone Between when someone says a line, and when someone says the next line, and when someone says the line, and when someone says the next line, I can, I can select Line, and when someone says the next line, I can slightly speed up up the video of the person who isn't says a line, and when someone says the next line, I can slightly speed up the video of the person who isn't talking. So by the time their response line comes back in, Between when someone says a line and when someone says the next line, I can slightly speed up the video of the person who isn't talking. So by the time their response line comes back in, it is at the time they thought it was. Now I know that's a little abstract and in different times I would be more about, you know, letting the kids' performances be what they are. But because we live in these challenging times, this is what these kids thought their performances were. When you can hear some bleed through from the Zoom performance, what I'm ending up doing is putting a, a person's response at the time they thought it was in relation to the other person's line. Just there's latency in there and so you have to make up for that. It took me about three days to cut all the different takes together and adjust the timing so that it sounded like a conversation again, and then maybe two more days to adjust the different spacings of the different boxes, add in some backgrounds and some other effects and stuff like that, and 
Bob's your uncle, there's a show. A couple other loose things we did. On YouTube, we used the premiere function so that everyone watches it at once. And there's some weirdness with the premiere function. You can only set it pre to premiere at every half hour, but only on 15 and 45. So you have to add in a countdown so that it counts down to seven o'clock when you want it to. We also, when people signed up for tickets using a Google form, we had a box where they could write some well wishes for the cast. Because again, we're trying to build back in that social experience that doesn't exist. And so then we were able to take all the little messages of break a leg or you're gonna do great and send them along to the cast so that it still felt like a show. And most importantly, at the end of the show, we had a screen that said, if you enjoyed the show, send your emails or your bravos to this address. So that again, you have that feedback loop of giving the applause back to the kids. And so that's how we did digital theater in the time of a global pandemic and socially distanced learning. Are there different ways to do it? Totally. Are there better ways to do it? Probably. Are we gonna do different things next time? Absolutely, we're gearing up for our musical, which man, who knows? We're gonna have to talk about pre-recording music and lip-syncing, maybe, who knows, when we get around to that one, maybe I'll be back here and let you know how it went. But I think my most important advice to the theater educators out there is, of course, do the best you can and don't worry about the rest. We're not worried about these kids falling behind, we're worried about these kids surviving a global pandemic, and anything you can do to give them the social emotional experience of putting on a show or even the distraction from the dumpster fire of the world out there is totally worth it. If you don't end up with a show at the end of it, that's fine, that's okay. We had, and if any of my students are watching this, sorry, but we had backup plans where if the thing totally went pear-shaped, we'd put out a nice 10 minute super cut of the funny moments that happened in Zoom rehearsals and talk about what a great time we had rehearsing and performing the show for ourselves. And would it be the final performance everyone expected? No, but it's not about the product always in educational theater. It's about the process. Every single time it's about the process. Even now, even socially distanced, even via Zoom with latency and tech problems and internet issues and Google Drive uploads that take five and a half hours. It's not about the product. It's about the process. It's about being together apart. It's about doing the best we can to create experiences for our students and ourselves that try and keep us mentally healthy during these challenging times. Hopefully some of that helped. Uh, honestly, if you have like detailed technical questions or whatever, put them down in the comments or hit me up on Twitter or something. I, I have found myself in a bizarre, unique position of being an in-person technical theater director who also happens to know a lot about digital video and internet stuff. So uh, I'd love to pass that along in whatever way that's useful. Best to you and yours. I hope you're coping with all of this. And I don't know, maybe I'll make a video about musical theater at some point in the future, who knows. Bye.